I am pleased to name Dr. Kyle Bushwick as a 2024 Frederick Howe Scholar in Computational Science. Kyle completed his PhD in Material Science and Engineering in 2023 at the University of Michigan under the supervision of Professor Kiopakis. After graduation, Kyle joined Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory as a postdoctoral researcher. Kyle's selection as a Howe Scholar reflects both his terrific research accomplishments and his stellar leadership and character. During his PhD, Kyle led breakthrough research in the use of atomistic simulation to understand the fundamentals of phonon-mediated quantum processes. A running theme throughout Kyle's research is the bridging of quantum mechanics and other fundamental physics with the practical study of technologically relevant materials. Kyle's contributions spanning physical theory, applied mathematics, and software development enabled the first use of modern high-performance computers to study the critical role that phonons play in Meitner-Auger recombination. Kyle also made important contributions to the modeling of optical properties of boron arsenide, leading to impactful collaborations with experimental research groups across the country. During his PhD, Kyle led or contributed to 11 peer-reviewed manuscripts. His technical accomplishments have important engineering implications in a broad range of application areas, including the development of higher efficiency photovoltaics. Separately, though, Kyle has also demonstrated exceptional leadership and character with wide-ranging impact as a champion of inclusivity and as a builder of community. A running theme throughout Kyle's service activities is the bridging of previously unconnected or underconnected research groups. Kyle served as, a president, as the president of the University of Michigan MSE Material Science and Engineering Graduate Student Council from 2021 to 22. His core achievements in this role included successfully advocating for graduate student participation in the department chair hiring process, leading a department-wide survey on the graduate student experience, and organizing numerous social and professional development events for graduate students in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. Kyle also served as the co-coordinator of the highly interdisciplinary Michigan State University wide, or University of Michigan wide sustainability and environmental workshop. Kyle also distinguished himself by dramatically expanding his department's graduate student STEM outreach program, establishing new relationships with local partner organizations in schools, museums, and libraries, and spreading the joy of science, especially in traditionally underserved communities. These relationships have continued growing beyond Kyle's time at the University of Michigan, a testament to his vision and enduring impact in the community. Dr. Kyle Bushwick is a role model for others as a computational scientist and as a leader by example. He embodies the qualities of technical strength and strength of character that Fred Howes encouraged in all early career scientists. Let's recognize Kyle. Thank you so much for that very kind introduction. I'm really excited to be able to be back so soon uh, speaking with everybody here. So I'm gonna talk a little bit uh, today about the work that I was doing at Michigan during my PhD. And I've kind of given this uh, broad title of Building Tools for Digital Laboratories, but I want to start with uh, an overview of kind of the material science paradigm. So as material scientists, uh, we like to think of this structure, properties, performance, and processing paradigms, so these kind of four key pillars that are really important to understand how materials behave and in our study of them. You can see we can arrange them in a tetrahedron because we love different atomic configurations and we can put at the center materials characterization because that's the key pillar that is important to understand the study of each of these kind of four pieces. And so now if we want to study materials, uh, we can do this in an experimental laboratory and there's many benefits to that, but there's also a number of drawbacks. Uh, the first, which is a pretty big one, is that you actually need your sample in hand to be able to study it in an experimental laboratory. Uh, but Study may also not allow for mechanistic insights into that material. So we might be able to study the efficiency of a solar cell. We don't know necessarily why we're getting the efficiency that we are. Experiments can also be slow, noisy, and expensive, both uh, with time as well as uh, resources. Right? You may have to travel to a beamline to be able to do a very high fidelity uh, spectroscopy. And so, all of these drawbacks are not to say that we should abandon experiment entirely, very much not the case, uh, but instead I want to highlight them as kind of uh, a foil to this idea of a digital laboratory where we can study these materials in complementary ways to experiment to enhance and accelerate our understanding of materials for designing them for uh, and improving them for the future. 
And so in this digital laboratory, right, we can study hypothetical materials. This material might not even exist yet, or we don't have high enough quality samples that have been synthesized to study uh, in different experiments. And a big benefit is that they also can provide uh, atomic or even subatomic resolution of these material properties. So we can start to gain more of a mechanistic understanding of uh, how the structure influences the properties, which influence the performance, and how processing may change the structure, and so on and so forth. So these are all kind of very interconnected pillars that we're interested in better understanding. And finally, uh, digital laboratories can be faster uh, and use understood approximations so we know kind of where we can apply the different tools and where those approximations will break down. And then finally, they're bounded by compute resources. So as long as we have computing power, we can kind of further expand our capabilities for uh, under studying uh, different materials. So to have a digital laboratory, you need to have a computational toolbox of tools in that laboratory. The material science computational toolbox is quite broad and diverse. Uh, I couldn't possibly put everything uh, on one slide, and I would certainly leave something out if I tried to do this myself. So I took this top uh, image just from the ASE website. So ASE is Atomic Simulation Environment. It's one of the you know, open source codes within the computational material science community. And these are just all different codes that they have interfaces with. Um, of course, there's many, many others that are not on this list, but I just want to give you a sense of the, the scope and scale of the different and diverse codes that exist within this community. Uh, in this work, I want to highlight kind of a number of codes that were very important for uh, my research. Quantum Espresso was really the workhorse for the density functional theory calculations or DFT calculations that we were doing. Berkeley GW is a code uh, that's actually sponsored primarily by the DOE and developed at Berkeley Lab and is built on top of Quantum Espresso and other DFT codes. Uh, and then Wania 90 and the OJ Meitner code, which is something that we developed at Michigan, as what will be the uh, kind of emphasis of my talk uh, moving forward. But before we go into uh, those specifics, I want to give a little bit of an overview. I know not everybody here is a material scientist, unfortunately. Uh, there's still time uh, to, to change majors. But if we go back to uh, high school chemistry, you can think about when you were learning uh, about atomic properties and uh, the electronic properties of atoms. And maybe you remember that electrons were really the key to uh, chemistry. And so you have your SPDF orbitals. You know, if you bring two atoms together, uh, those orbitals start to hybridize. And so you get molecular orbitals, your, anti your bonding and antibonding states. And so this is a relatively simple picture to have. Uh, things get a little bit more complicated when we extend the picture to solids. And so in a crystal, which is you can think of as effectively an uh, infinitely repeating lattice of atoms or molecules all together, you get kind of a further hybridization. And so these electronic states become electronic bands. And we have, similar to the, the bonding and antibonding states, we have these val valence bands and conduction bands. And so at rest, the valence bands are filled, so all of your electrons occupy your valence bands, and the conduction bands are empty states which you can excite to, like your bonding and antibonding states. And another key piece of this, uh, in semiconductor materials, which are the, the class of materials that I was studying during my PhD, is that you have this band gap. So there is a region uh, in energy space where you cannot have any uh, occupation from the electron. So this is like differences in the energy between the, the bonding and antibonding states, right? There's this quantization of energy. So these are just some key kind of pieces to remember as we move forward. Now if we take a, a pause from electrons for a moment and think about just the, the crystal itself, so the atoms, we can think of a, a simple picture. So let's just say a 1D chain of atoms. We can assume that those are just masses and they're connected by springs. So this is like the bonding uh, characteristics. And you can see that we can write and show uh, the collective motion of these atoms. So atoms aren't just stationary at their lattice points in crystals. They're always moving around due to thermal energy and fluctuations. And so that moving around can be uh, decomposed into these collective motions, which we call phonons. And uh, if we extend this picture, you can see a number of different kind of wavelengths and, and wave vectors of these oscillations in, a, again, a more kind of complicated picture where you have maybe different types of atoms in 3D space. Uh, we can now think about this as and represent it as a, a phonon band structure, which is analogous or similar to the electronic band structure. But this really shows the vibrational properties of your uh, crystal cell. And so uh, this is just an example from one of the, the works I uh, had an opportunity to work on where we were looking at uh, rutile germanium oxide. The details of that aren't important, but this is just to give uh, an example of some of the, actually like in practice, 
the different motions of atoms that we're interested in, in studying and being able to decompose and understand these different modes of vibration, how they're going to impact the overall properties of your material. The final uh, little bit of introductory uh, that I want to give is on electronic transitions. So we have our electrons, we have our phonons, uh, but this is generally a kind of a picture at rest or at ground state. And so the final piece of the puzzle that's going to be important for uh, the digital laboratory in studying these materials in our calculations is this idea of an electronic transition. So I have here again a schematic of a band structure. So you have your valence bands and conduction bands. And let's say that we have some perturbation to the system. So there's a photon or a, a packet of light coming in. And maybe that electron, one of the electrons, interacts with that photon and it takes that energy and it gets promoted into a higher energy state. So this is just kind of one example of a, a quantum process or electronic transition, in this case, uh, optical absorption. But this can happen in a number of different ways, but the two that are going to be important uh, for this talk are kind of the direct and phonon-assisted picture. So the direct picture, you just have a kind of a single instance of this uh, interaction, and it's a, a one-step process. And there's just an initial and final state. In the phonon-assisted case, things get a little more complicated where you have this intermediate step and then also the interaction with a phonon. So that you can have coupling not only between this external perturbation, the photon, but also those atomic vibrations or phonons. And so that's kind of represented by this uh, piece in purple here. And so uh, with kind of this in our back pocket, we can move forward, uh, but I want to make things a little bit more concrete as well. So let's say that we want to study photovoltaics or solar cells. We can think about the device, right? This is something that you can find on the roof of a building. But we can zoom in a little bit and think about the materials that make up that device. So let's say we're talking about silicon solar cells. We can zoom in further and look at the atomic structure and the electronic structure. And so from this, uh, this is really kind of where we're, what we're studying in our digital laboratory. So we're zooming in all the way to the atomistic scale and thinking about kind of at a fundamental level the properties of silicon. And so we start from the atomic arrangements and then we can solve the Cohen-Sham equations, which are an approximation of the Schrodinger's equation. And from that, gain the electronic structure, which can, we can then in our digital laboratory using these computational tools, uh, actually calculate these quantum processes that are going to give rise to the properties of the material. So to bring this back to the material science tetrahedron, we're really interested in kind of this edge of uh, that shape, so the, the structure properties relationship in material science and understanding how the structure is going to influence those properties and ultimately how those properties will influence and kind of dictate the performance of any device that we're making from that material. So I've kind of alluded to this and uh, the intro we talked about oj meitner recombination, but what is oj meitner recombination? Uh, even for folks who are in this field, many have not heard of what the process is, so I want to give a, a brief overview of that. And so it's a three carrier uh, process that involves an electron and a hole and either another electron or another hole. So I'm showing on the left, uh, in this case we have that third carrier is another electron. And so in both cases, one of the electrons and holes is going to recombine across the band gap and transfer their energy to that third carrier. So if that third carrier is an electron, which we show here, we call this the EEH process. If that third carrier is a hole, uh, we call that the HHE process. And this can happen, uh, as I alluded to, in a direct way where energy and momentum are strictly conserved between those carriers, or in a phonon-assisted process where we have an intermediate state and phonon emission or absorption uh, as well. And so it turns out that the, the phonon-assisted process is quite important when we're studying oj meitner recombination in uh, silicon. And I'll get into that uh, as we go on. Before I do go on, though, I want to take a brief note on naming. Uh, if you were here last year, you saw the same slide. Uh, but if you're in material science or chemistry, you've perhaps heard of OJ recombination or OJ electrons, OJ spectroscopy. And these are all named after uh, Pierre Auger, who uh, was one of the people who first uh, discovered this process in kind of atomic systems. But uh, Dr. Lisa Meitner, who is a renowned scientist in her own right, actually discovered it a year before Dr. Pierre Auger. And there's been a proposal within the community, which we are uh, whole wholeheartedly uh, in support of, to rename the, the process as OJ Meitner to reflect and acknowledge her contributions, given the often overlooked contributions of female scientists, uh, not only in our field, but kind of across fields. And so I refer to this process as OJ Meitner recombination uh, throughout my work. And I just wanted to take a moment to recognize that history uh, with you all here.
Um, so why do we care about OJ mitner recombination? So I'm going to be focusing on uh, silicon. Silicon is a very important material, both uh, as a solar cell material, but also as a transistor material. It's kind of the underpinning of a lot of our modern technology. Uh, and so OJ mitner recombination is one of three kind of intrinsic recombination processes that can happen in any semiconductor. So you have shockley reed hall or defect recombination, radiative recombination, and OJ mitner recombination, which are one, two, and three carrier processes, respectively. And it turns out that OJ mitner recombination acts as a loss mechanism. And so we can see that actually the maximum theoretical efficiency, if you only have radiative recombination, is higher than if we include OJ mitner recombination. This is by only 1 or 2%. But when we think about the scale of uh, technology such as uh, silicon photovoltaics or silicon transistors, right, even small increases in the maximum efficiency of a device have wide-ranging consequences. And so when we think about uh, the efficiency of silicon solar cells over time, which I'm showing in this plot up here, right, we're starting to actually reach the maximum efficiency of these devices as our engineering processes have gotten much better. Right? The processing aspect of that material science tetrahedron, we're improving those processes, which are improving the structure and therefore properties and performance of these uh, devices. And so when we think about the scope and scale again of photovoltaics moving forward, as we think about including more renewable energy into our infrastructure, understanding how to increase the efficiency of these devices is quite important. So not only silicon solar cells, but also transistors, LEDs, lasers, really any uh, device that's going to include a semiconductor, uh, we care about this potential loss mechanism. So uh, getting into a little bit more of the details, the computational methods, so what are these tools that we're using in our digital laboratory to study this process? I know it's always a little bit dangerous to put uh, big equations on slides, so we don't need to go into the details of this. And I actually, the next slide, I'll break this down a little bit more. Uh, but the key kind of takeaway here is that we're using uh, a tool called Fermi's Golden Rule in both first and second order perturbation theory for the direct and phonon assisted process, respectively. And we're using these codes as the basis for our calculations. So quantum espresso is kind of the DFT and also density functional perturbation theory, uh, which we're using to get the phonon calculations and also the electron phonon coupling. And then Berkeley GW, we use to get quasi-particle corrections for our band structures. And so all this is to say, when I was talking about we know kind of where approximations of these tools break down, one of the shortcomings of DFT is that it underestimates the band gap. And in this uh, application space, we really care about getting the band gap accurately. And so we know that there's other tools that we can use to kind of correct for those shortcomings of uh, some of our other techniques. And so that's what we're doing there. To get into the details uh, a little bit more, again, you don't need to know like all of this kind of physics and the, the quantum aspect of it, but just keep in mind that we care about two matrix elements which are describing the physical process of this quantum transition, and by calculating that, uh, we can actually get the rate of this process in a material. And so those two processes are the, the Coulomb matrix element, which is describing this Coulomb uh, effect where one carrier, uh, the electron and hole annihilate and transfer that energy to a third carrier. So that's the Coulomb matrix element, which we can write like this between these one, two, three, four states. So those are our initial and final states. And the matrix element is describing that process. And likewise, with the phonon assisted bit, we have the electron phonon matrix element, which is describing the coupling between our electrons and phonons, or the electrons and those lattice vibrations. And so we can study these and calculate these in our digital laboratories, and then therefore get the C, which is the coefficient of the AMR, so how frequently this process will happen in a material. To do this, uh, we have to do, uh, had to do some code development. So this code has existed as a, a physics research code in our group for, for quite a while, uh, with varying degrees of capabilities. And so to make these calculations possible in silicon, which has kind of some unique properties in its band structure, where it's no longer a uh, gamma-centered band gap, so the valence band maximum and conduction band minimum don't align, they're offset. And so this makes it a little bit more challenging uh, computationally to handle. And so uh, we were able to, to do that with kind of some, some classic uh, techniques that you'll see throughout the talks uh, this week. But the thing that I wanted to highlight on this slide, which is probably most useful for everybody in this room, uh, especially the, the students, uh, is this bottom corner here. So one of the, the pieces that I uh, was working on was actually leveraging processor parallelism for serial executables. So we had a number of these calculations that we needed to do that only used a single processor. But as you know, most of the HPC resources that we use have tons of tons of processors. Um, and so you can run one at a time, but that's very inefficient. And so I was actually able to open a ticket and ask for help at NERSC. And so NERSC is uh, 
one of the, the largest computing centers at, at Berkeley Lab. And as fellows, I think everybody still gets uh, access to resources there. And I just wanted to highlight that, A, this is a resource that you have at your disposal to be able to open a ticket and ask for help from an expert, uh, but also that, to encourage you to actually do it. Right? You're, they're probably going to help you uh, solve your problem a lot more efficiently uh, than you could on your own. And which is not to say, you know, as soon as you have a problem, open a ticket, because there's a lot to be learned from trial and error as well. But know that that's a resource that exists, and definitely take advantage of it. Um, the final bit on this slide, I just wanted to give a sense of the scope and scale of these calculations. So for silicon, which is perhaps one of the most simple uh, materials that we can look at in terms of the actual DFT uh, underlying it, to assess the oj meitner recombination uh, coefficients, we actually require kind of on the order of terabytes of memory uh, for these calculations. So this is not something that you could just run on your laptop. So with all of that said, uh, we can get into some actual results. Uh, and I need to speed up a little bit here to, to get through the talk. But uh, we can first look at the, the direct uh, process. And so I have the schematics on the right of what that looks like and the data on the left. And so these dots are experiments. And so we can see we're actually pretty close uh, in the EEH process, which is kind of consistent with what the literature had told us, of orders of magnitude away in HHE. And so this is a known problem, so it's good that we're reproducing uh, literature. But the question has really been, you know, what is responsible for this gap in the HHE process? And so our hypothesis, among which we shared with uh, other folks, was that it's the phonons. And so by doing this code development, we're able to uh, expand the tools at our disposal and do these calculations. And indeed, we see that the phonons are, uh, play a large contribution. And so we can look at the total amount, and we see really nice agreement with experiments. If we look at kind of the schematics, it, it makes sense kind of intuitively why this is the case. I'll go back to the direct. Right? There are states available for us to scatter to in a direct process in the EEH case. But for HHE, because of the structure of the bands, the valence bands, there's no states for that hole to scatter to. But when we get extra momentum from a phonon, all of a sudden now we can access these states. Uh, so I say we have good agreement. You may see on the left, uh, there's not so good agreement, but this is also something that we uh, understand. At lower carrier concentrations, you have a many-body effect called Coulomb enhancement that starts to play a role. So this is, again, uh, understanding the approximations within our calculations. This is expected behavior, and we can use models uh, to look at kind of the expected behavior. And ultimately, we are interested in including this capability in our code, but it's kind of another level of computational complexity. So that's ongoing work. I'm going to skip over this for now, but uh, key, the key takeaway here is that in addition to getting these total rates, right, by using these digital tools, we can actually decompose the total rate into constituent elements and better understand the mechanisms of this process. Through that understanding, we can also now think about ways to tune the material process and actually affect uh, the material system, so change the structure to change the properties and therefore the performance. And so in silicon, uh, what I'm showing here are kind of pictures of the valence band or the conduction band valleys. So in that uh, band structure that I had shown before, there was a single valley, but that actually is six-fold degenerate because of the symmetry of the crystal. And the valence bands typically have three-fold degeneracy in the unstrained case. But when we apply strain, so if we pull or push on the crystal, we can change that degeneracy and uh, kind of selectively occupy the valleys and bands. So this is a potential tuning knob that we have to affect uh, those, the structure, which will therefore affect the properties. And so uh, we did this. And unfortunately, for the most part, it affected the properties by increasing the AMR coefficient, which is not what we wanted to see. We did find one uh, case where it in decreased uh, the overall rate, which is very exciting. And so in a case where you have uh, a p-type region, so you have a lot of holes, but you care about your electrons being able to survive, so you care about your minority carrier lifetime, uh, then applying tensile biaxial strain may increase the efficiency of your device. Of course, the picture is a little bit more complicated than that because applying strain will not just change the AMR coefficient, but other properties as well. But this is uh, kind of an example of how we can use these tools to better understand a material. So I'm going to leave my conclusion slide. Uh, I'm going to not actually go through this other than to definitely recognize the, the resources that made this research possible. Uh, of course, the DOE, both through the Computational Material Science Program and definitely, of course, the, the Computational Science Graduate Fellowship, Krell, uh, as well as NERSC for the, the computing resources. But before I wrap up, I wanted to end with uh, kind of other work that I was doing that's not my research, but is still really, really important uh, 
during my PhD and kind of moving forward. And so I want to start with a, an example and then kind of a final take home message. Oh, of course, yeah, I should also mention that coming soon to GitHub near you, uh, a yet to be named AMR code. So we're releasing this code open source. Uh, as I said, it was a physics code, it was very messy. Uh, and so we're looking at kind of refactoring that and rewriting it to make it a lot more user friendly and usable. Uh, so if you're interested in these types of calculations, uh, keep an eye out and I'm happy to talk about that more at any point. Um, but to, to wrap up, so this is one of the projects that I was able to uh, work on at Michigan. We partnered, uh, we being uh, some grad students in the department, partnered with the, the Museum of Art at University of Michigan to develop some curriculum uh, for some of their exhibits. And so there were a number of different pieces and we were interested in exploring and explaining how material science concepts actually were really central to making the art what it was. And so uh, we actually were able to build uh, these QR codes and websites that had a lot of kind of discussion of translating some of this uh, kind of hardcore science for lay audiences and getting to share some of the interest and curiosity that you can have by applying a material science lens to your understanding of the world around you. Of course, we also have the material science tetrahedron there to, to let people know uh, what to be looking for. Um, but in addition to working with folks at the museum, we also worked with uh, faculty in the department to bring their classes uh, to the, the art museum. And so thinking about a lot of the concepts they were talking about in the context outside of just the classroom. And so this is a quote from one of the undergrads who was in a class there. And I, I take this as an example to uh, show that a lot of the outreach activities were kind of taking your research outside of the research lab. There's many, many different ways to do that. And so the, the take home message I wanna leave uh, with everybody here and especially the, the new fellows, but uh, really everybody is to get involved. And I know you've probably heard that before and it can sometimes uh, feel a bit intimidating to know how do I get involved? What, what do I do? Who do I talk to? So I wanted to give my take uh, on some of the answers to these questions uh, really briefly. And so take this with a grain of salt. It's one person's perspective, but hopefully uh, you might find it helpful. Uh, and so to answer the first question, who? Uh, some of these are maybe a little bit non-answers, but really the who can be super broad. So there's everything from national societies to local groups, uh, student unions, university groups that are interdisciplinary or within your department, so a grad student council. What are you going to do? Well, I think the most important thing is sharing your excitement. In academia, it can be really easy to kind of get stuck in your own bubble. And I think it's really important to be able to branch out and share your excitement and passion and the really interesting work that you're doing with the rest of the world. Uh, that's one of the things that I think is the most fun about this annual review is getting to come here and see the amazing work that everybody's doing in fields that I know nothing about. And I think taking that spirit and sharing it more broadly uh, is a really great thing to be able to do. And especially as you kind of continue on, right, being able to share your experiences and lessons learned as a senior grad student with younger grad students, as a younger grad student with folks who are maybe considering grad school, right, you have your own story and journey and being able to share that with other people is valuable no matter what. Um, in terms of where, right, there's so many different opportunities to be able to get involved, whether those are university sanctioned events that are always looking for volunteers to be helping out, local schools. So even if you are going to a school not where you grew up, there's probably folks in your cohort uh, who did grow up there, and maybe they know their elementary and middle and science uh, and high school science teachers or math teachers who got them inspired and would love to have you come back and uh, show, you know, what people are doing at the college or university level uh, with their students, right? But other things like libraries, museums, and even online uh, during COVID, we got a lot of expertise in uh, doing online outreach with folks, not only at schools in our area, but even more broadly. So expanding your geographical reach. In terms of when, really any time. And I kind of got into this in some of the earlier bullet points, but whether you're just starting grad school or uh, just about to graduate or you've already defended, and you're into your, your postdoc or your professional career, right? there's really no bad time to get involved. And why? There's so many different answers uh, to the question why, but one that I wanted to take a moment to highlight, and again, this is kind of just from my own experience, is that you know, research is key. It's the reason that you're here. It's the reason you're in grad school, but it also isn't everything. right? You are a full person with other interests outside of just research, uh, and so it can be really helpful, I think, to gain that outside perspective and context on uh, your work. Uh, and 
It's also a great antidote to imposter syndrome, which is something that I definitely experience, and I'm sure many people, uh, if you talk to in this audience, both early career and late career, uh, have experienced and still experience. And so being able to share and realize how much you do know with uh, folks is really important. So with that, I'll leave this up, because I think this is the most important slide I have, um, and I'm happy to take any questions.